Hi everybody and welcome back. So we've spent at least five nights, I think it's five nights, imaging SH2-115. So I told you I was going to make a video on how I do my processing, so let's get started. Alright, so the first thing that I do is called Blink. And I use Blink to actually analyze all of the images. So let me make this a little bit smaller. So I'm going to say open. And I believe, let's see, the lights. And I do raw folders because I want to see all of the images that I took on night one in this case. We're going to go ahead and open that up. Now, I do use a gaming computer, so my processes may actually run faster than yours. Um, I know a substantial amount of people will try to do this on a laptop. Some of these processes with in picks insight are incredibly uh, CPU intensive. So with that, all I do is I look at the stars. So if I make this just a little bit wider and I zoom in, I'm going to stay on these stars here. And what I essentially look for is anything with a big shift. If it has a substantial amount of shift, then you're likely going to have problems later with stacking. So I usually don't save those images. So what I'll do is I'll look at these three stars, for example, and I'm going to press play over here and it's going to run really fast, but I'm going to watch these three stars and then they will flip and they'll be on the other side. So I'll find it just on the spot another three stars or so to look at. I will keep an eye on them and look to make sure that they're at least roughly circular. Sometimes they might be elongated. That's usually okay because once I go into Astro Pixel Processor and I tell it to stack only 85% of my best images, it will do an HFR ev evaluation, which is with the half flux radius of the star or essentially how circular it is and how large it is. And anything that's, let's say, 5 and the rest of them are 4, it will automatically filter that one out because its score wasn't as good as the other. So let's press play. And we can see we've got a good rotation because I did tell the mount to go ahead and dither after so many images. And you can see it just keeps running through the cycle. And as I look at those stars, I don't see anything in here that tells me that I can't use all of this data. So what I'm going to do is click back into this window. I'm going to do Control A to select all. I'm going to click this right here, which is basically to move the files. And I'm going to go from raw folder to verified night one. And I'm going to say select folder. It's going to move them all. I'm going to close Then I'm going to go open and I'm going back to raw night two. Same thing. Control A to select all and then open. Now, once they open and I did forget to say this on the last one, once they open, click this icon right here. This will apply a rough histogram stretch to all of them. It doesn't do a permanent one. It's more of a preview, if you will. So if this one right here, if you hover over it, it'll tell you it will apply an automatic histogram transformation on all images. Now, why that's important is as you go through these images, all of a sudden your screen will just go black because they don't all have this preview. So same thing, we're on a different night. We're going to go ahead and evaluate. Do we have anything that really sticks out? And you can see on one of those images, we had a massive satellite come through. So uh, we will keep an eye on this particular one. I don't usually like to keep images that have a satellite streak that runs right through my main target. And in this case, this is hydrogen. The nice thing about hydrogen is it tends to filter out a little bit better than something like oxygen. I don't personally know why that is, but I do find that hydrogen can filter out satellite streaks much easier than oxygen. And sulfur also does a, a decent job, but oxygen is usually uh, the problem one. And then when you do LRGB, I find that uh, blue and green are also problematic when it comes to this. So Let's zoom in again. I didn't see anything that really stuck out as that star looks bad. And if you don't like to go that fast, you can always slow it down to like a half of a second. So you can look at them with a little bit more time. From what I'm seeing here, I don't see anything that stands out. So again, I'm going to go Control A to select all. And I'm going to move these folders to Verified Night 2. So I will go ahead and just speed up this process because I have more nights to do. And uh, I'll get back with you when we get ready to stack. This is what I'm 
looking for. And I know exactly what happened on this particular image. Since I set my telescope up on the deck, any movements on the deck can make the mount move. I happen to have stepped on the deck to grab something. And when I did it, I looked at my guiding and it jumped all the way to two and a half seconds of error. That's what you're gonna see here. When I did that, the star literally shifted around ever so slightly, but just enough that it has ruined this entire 10 minute long exposure of oxygen. In this case, what I'll do is I'm gonna click on just it, and now I'm gonna click this single panel. If you click this one, it will close all of your images. Don't do that. Just close the selected image. So what that'll do for me now is when I go to move all of these files to my verified, meaning I've looked at them, I'm content with what I'm seeing, it will leave that one in my raw folder and it'll move only the ones that I like to my verified. So that's a perfect example of what it is I actually look for when I'm starting this blink process. So we'll speed it back up. So now I am officially done looking at all the files. They look good enough for me, right? And I'm only checking for stars. I'm not really looking at too much else because if the stars are good, the rest of the data in theory should be fine. So the next thing I'm gonna do here is boot up Astro Pixel Processor because we are ready to stack all of this. So we are now inside of Astro Pixel Processor. So I've already shown a video of how to use Astro Pixel Processor and what I use. So I'm not gonna explain every single thing this time. Please visit that other video when it pops up or go down to the description to get that link. You'll be able to follow along with why I'm doing what I'm doing a little bit better by seeing that video. But in this case, let's go ahead and get started. So we're gonna go ahead and create our new folder. 21 is today's date. And it's easier for me at least to do it this way by labeling it by year, then month, and then date. So I'm gonna say open. Now we're gonna call this sh2-115. And I'm going to load it all up, so I'll speed this part up because it is going to take a minute. Okay, so we finally have all of those loaded, and you can see I've got way more calibration frames than I do light frames. So I'm gonna leave everything else exactly as it is. We'll go to calibrate. I'm just gonna make sure that this adaptive pedestal is turned on, but otherwise I'm gonna leave everything as is. Stars, because we have so many pairings, I'm gonna go ahead and bump this up to a thousand. Register, I'm not gonna change anything in this setup because we did use the same camera and optics the entire time, but we're gonna go to normalize. I'm not gonna change any parameters on normalize either. I'm gonna go to integrate. Now in this case, we're gonna go to, I'm gonna do the best 90% of my images. We're gonna change integrate to average. And the reason being is if we hover over it, average is if you have more than 20 frames, you use average integration. Then we're gonna use quality, be my weight. And the reason being is if you look at it, it's going to give it a score based on noise, star density, star size, and star shape. So rejection filter, I'm gonna do adaptive rejection. And so with the kappa low and the kappa high, if we read this tooltip here, we actually wanna increase this because I don't want it to clip a substantial amount. So I'm gonna bump this from the, the native six to seven. We're gonna change kappa low to seven, and we're also gonna bump this up to about 3.8. That way we're on the higher end on both of these spectrums and we clip less. Diffraction protection, I usually put this at about five. And then because we did have multiple nights, but I can do this correction inside of PixInsight, I'm gonna leave it alone. And we're gonna do multiband blending and we've got plenty of overlap, so let's say that. And now I'm gonna go ahead and integrate. And this is going to take a while because of how many files that I've got. So. I'm going to stop here and we'll check back as soon as it's done. So I just got the ding. It's done. So let's take a look at what we got. The first thing we're going to look at is the sulfur. Then we're going to look at the oxygen. 
And now we're going to look at the one that really is going to make a huge pop. Look at all of that gas and dust just surrounding this entire complex. The, the entire region of Cygnus is amazing. And areas of focus are going to be the two nebulae side by side with the little the bubble one up in the top. I actually need to look. What is that? Um, so let's hop over into Pix Insight. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to File. And I'm going to say Load Project. And I have my new blank. So this is going to load up all of the windows that I typically use. Now they're kind of messed up because I have to change my resolution to do these videos. Okay, so these are typically in the order in which I'm going to do these. I highly recommend this book here by Warren Keller and the team that helped put this book together. Uh, Inside Picks Insight Second Edition. You can get this on Amazon. There are a lot of great items in this book, especially for people who haven't used it. And even more so, those that have because after reading this, there were elements of processes that I was running that I didn't fully understand. And this book really breaks down how that works. And I recommend using this as your guide for processing. Make sure you understand what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you I am an expert at their level by any means. I've merely taken their advice and I've tried to apply it in a process that works for me. So to open an image in PixInsight, if you've never used it, you just simply double click the background. And now I'm going to go over to my SH2 file. I'm going to go to my AstroPixel processor file. And now you can see all of the files in the directory that we had set inside of AstroPixel processor. But the ones that I care about are going to be down here, these three. So I held the shift key and I selected all of them. And I'm going to say open. So the first thing I do before I do anything else after this step is I go to image integration. Um, so if I go to the process, all processes, it should be image integration right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually grab these same three files and I'm going to stack all three of them together to make one super luminance, if you will, image. I don't always use it but I want to have it in the event that I do decide to use it. And it's easier to do this process now and then decide you don't want to use it later if that's what you choose. It just depends on what works best with your image. I find sometimes my luminance, I uh, do a histogram stretch that makes it a little too bright. So when I apply it to my darker colored image, it loses its coloring, it loses its saturation, it, it loses elements that I found were important to begin with. And when that happens, sometimes I don't use the luminance or I try to tweak whatever I can to keep it as close as possible. So now we have all of these files. And the first thing I like to do is minimize all of them and rename them. So hydrogen alpha, I'm going to just call it HA and I'm going to say one because I do different iterations sometimes and I want to make sure I keep it in order. This one's going to be 031, and you can name this whatever you want. And there's a multiple ways inside of Pix Insight to rename these. I like to click this little N key at the bottom, and that allows me to rename it. You can actually uh, right-click it and say Set Image Identifier, or I can double-click the image. And over here, if I double-click the title along this tab over here, I can rename it. So three ways to do the same exact step. I like this one because I don't have to open it up and it allows me to get whatever naming convention I want in there. And I'm gonna call this SL1 for Super Luminance 1. I picked up the name Super Luminance with uh, Steven from entering into space on YouTube. So if Steven's watching this, just know I am stealing from you. With that, let's go put these together. I'm a little OCD about how they're displayed. Now, we want to do a crop, and why we want to do a crop is because we want to get all of the data that we are actually going to process and remove all of the stuff, such as the overlaps or the black space. Um, for example, if I open this image, I can't actually see all of my bars, but let's do that. So I don't really want all this black space because I can do things that will pick up this black space here and will alter my image in a way that I don't really want. So what I'm going to do is crop, but since I don't know where my S2 and my O3 crops need to be, it's easiest if you take that super luminance and up here, I'm going to, and I, you know, I guess I could do it down here. You're going to look for screen transfer function. I put it on my desktop here. I'm going to double click it. Now, 
I'm going to remove the chain links because it just it works better for me that way. And I'm going to click the little uh, radiation looking button here, which is for auto stretching. It doesn't actually apply the stretch, but what it does is it gives you a view of your data. Um, sometimes I find that it does overstretch it, so do not worry about what you're seeing. So the first thing that I want to do here is I want to go up to process. And I'm going to go to all processes, and then I'm going to go to dynamic crop. And the reason being is, and this is really, really cool how they did this. So let me pull it over here to this part of the screen. So now what I got to do is I got to click this button down here, which is going to be the reset, but it picks up this imaging area of my image. Then I'm going to go up to the corners and you see where those the square has little um, filled squares come up. That means now I can grab the outside of those bars and I can pull them in. And now what I'm going to do is just pull it down just enough and just in enough to pull cover all of my overlapped areas i'm gonna do the same thing here i'm gonna look from the left side that should be good from the left side perspective and from the bottom i'm gonna pull it up just a little bit and we'll call that good right there so now what i'm gonna do is because i need to save this down here in this new instance uh tab looking um, icon i'm gonna click hold and drag this down this will now set an instance of this onto the background. And I'm going to rename this to Dine Crop. So now what I could actually do is close this and watch this. I can grab that instance. I can click, hold, and drag and drop it right onto the image and boom, it's right there. But the nice thing is, is I can get that exact same framing on every single image. I don't have to crop each one manually and then later have to do a star alignment to get them realigned. This behaves in that same facet. So I'm going to go ahead and do it to all of them. And I'm going to go ahead and go to screen transfer function. And I'm going to go ahead and stretch that just to see the data. And S2, I'm going to do the same thing. Screen transfer function, radiation button. And I'm going to minimize it just to get rid of it. Click, hold, and drag. And now... All of our images are already star aligned from Astro Pixel Processor, but now they're properly cropped. I'm going to open up Channel Combination. And now, if you're trying to follow along and do your own videos based off of my video, um, I am going to try to slow down and make sure that if you want to follow along with some of these processes, you can. So now, Channel Combination is open. And you can see I already have defaulted in options, and I did that on purpose, and then I saved this. This will save you time if you set up all of your icons and then save it as a blank project. Now the way to do that is you can go to File, Save Project. And then what you can do is just say don't include images and then that way it doesn't save any of the images themselves. It'll just save everything that's over here. And then I called my new blank too because I had a new blank at one point and I deleted it. So I just load this new blank every single time and then that way all of the tools that I know I consistently use, they open up automatically for me. I'm gonna close out of that and all I have to do now is click, hold, and drag. So I'm gonna drag the HA down. I'm gonna click, hold, and drag the oxygen down and the sulfur. And now how do I know what to drag where? I'm gonna use the SHO Hubble palette for coloring. That means sulfur will be designated red, hydrogen will be designated green, and oxygen will be designated blue. Now, you can do an HOO image, absolutely, but I find when you do multiple variations of red, you do get some pink in there, and you get some other um, gradients of red, but the problem is you don't get a ton of definition. You know, red is red at the end of the day, and you don't really get to see these areas of multiple gases where they overlap and such, and you can really do that with an SHO, or sulfur, hydrogen, oxygen, color palette. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Once we've done that, we're going to click to apply global, and it's going to generate a new image, and then this is where the fun begins. We're going to go back to screen transfer function, and here's why you want to unlock it. Let's relock the chain and click this. And now we're going to unclick it. And you can see there is a difference, right? This will stretch all of the colors approximately the same. Whereas here, PixInsight's going to use its best guess as to what you actually want it to look like. 
Uh, you can actually see with the linked, we get a little more contrast, but when we unlink it, we get a little bit more of color variation in the green channel in particular because the red and green mix a little bit more and it does look like we get less green and a little more turquoise with the unlocked. So this is not a permanent stretch. This is just so we can view our data and this is what we're working with. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rename this image right now. I'm gonna call it SHO1. And again, I like to put the one in there because if I do a clone, I'll call it SHO2. Two. And then I can follow a progression of my imaging and make sure that, oh, if I don't like SHO3, I need to go back to SHO2 and start again at a particular step. So I'm going to call this SHO1. Now, the first thing I like to do here, and I actually found this from Visible Dark on YouTube, and I really like doing this, is I'm going to go to Background Modelization, and then I'm going to go to Dynamic Background Extraction. Now, the first thing we're going to do, it to me at first it was really bizarre. Um, but we're going to just type in two because we're in 50 radius boxes. And I'm going to say seven and I'm going to say generate. So I get these big, awesome boxes all around. And now you're probably thinking, well, why are you doing this? What I'm going to do is I'm going to normalize this image. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to division, normalize, discard, and replace. And now when we're ready to run it, we can click the check mark or we can drag and drop on top of it. I'm just going to click the check mark. But then now, because I kind of want to save this general setup, I am going to click, hold, and drag to create a new instance of this right down here at the bottom. And then we'll close it because I can just simply double click it and it'll come right back up to everything that we set. Now, one caveat is... I do notice that these boxes no longer hit the edges when you put this on any other image. As you just saw, I opened this up and there's a gap on the same image that I just did. You will likely have a gap each time and you'll have to reset it each time, unfortunately, by just clicking generate. And then you'll have to go delete those inner squares. We only want the inner ones deleted. We want to leave a radius all around. So now let's take a look at what it is we actually did. And I wish, I guess I can just open screen transfer function here and maybe make it smaller. That'll work. So we're going to put that just right up here because we're going to do use that fairly often. So before and after. And you can see we have a little bit of color gradient in there. But as soon as we do that and undo it, you can see the image bouncing a little bit. And then from that... Because most of this area is nebulosity, sometimes the automatic background extraction works the best. So to find that, you go to all processes each time. I find this is so much easier and go to automatic background extraction. I don't usually change anything except for if you just ran the process that we just ran, unselect this normalize. You don't need it again. And then click, hold, drag, and drop. And then your screen's going to go black. Now we're going to come back to screen transfer function. We're going to click on the radiation button again. And now we're going to look at our image and we're going to try to evaluate it. The easiest way for me to evaluate what it is we just did is to make a clone. Oh, and I guess I should explain. If you click and hold this tab, it will then create a clone of the image you just created. So I'll close it because I've got one back here. But now we're going to undo what we just did, and we're going to rescreen transfer function this. And let's put some of this side by side and take a look. So you can see we have a much stronger signal of green here. We have more prominent background space over here. Let's zoom in a little bit, keep it similar, three to two. There we go. So let's look at our background areas here, and you can see the automatic background extraction pulled out some of this haze and was really able to create some contrast and depth within our image by simply removing some of the stuff that's right over the background. We can come up here and we can check into our detail areas and see how they look. Uh, let's move it a little farther to the side and let's see if we can't match these up similarly. We can see we have really good detail um, on both of these, but you can tell that this one pops just a little bit more now. I'm gonna minimize it. I'm gonna leave SHO1 over here to the side. And we're gonna work off of this one, and we're gonna call this SHO2. 
And again, I like to do it this way just because I can follow my work a little bit better. Um, it's easier to go back and re-manipulate something when it's a clean slate as opposed to undoing 400 times just to get back to that single step. And we're gonna work off of this image now. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get to a patch of the darkest area that I can find. And I think that's gonna be right here. So we're gonna zoom in quite a bit. And now I'm gonna hold the Alt key and then press the N key and then let go. You can see my cursor changed and now I can draw a preview screen. What we're going to do is we're going to say this is our background. And then I'm going to zoom out here. And you can see it's tiny. But the next thing we're going to do here is this background neutralization and color calibration. So when you open up background neutralization, over here on the side, we're going to tell it what preview we want it to do. We're going to click the drop down and we're going to go to SH2 preview 01 and we can confirm that preview 01 SH02 is the image. I'm going to say OK. And then I'm going to click over here and say new instance and drop it. Our image just got really weird. But after we do this, we just simply need to reopen screen transfer function and click the radiation button again. Process, all processes, and you can find color calibration right here. So anytime I click one of these icons off my desktop, just simply go to process, all processes, and then find them alphabetically in that order. The same thing, except up here, we're gonna leave white reference exactly where it is. Our target image will be the SH2 image, excuse me, SHO2 image uh, inherently. Over here, though, this background reference point is where we put our preview. So I'm going to say that that's our background. And now I'm going to click hold, drag and drop. Once this runs, I'm then going to minimize color calibration because we are done with it. And I'm going to restretch the image. And now you can see a little bit better of a color balance. We're not really dominated by green, but we're not dominated by blue, and we're not dominated by red. Everything should be relatively equal at this point because we've balanced it. So I'm going to minimize screen transfer function. So now that we've got all of this, we've got our color calibration, everything looks really good. I'm going to run noise exterminator. If you don't know what Noise Exterminator is, it is not free. There is a free trial to run with it. Um, Russell Crowman has created a phenomenal tool. And he shows you, if you hover over this image, it shows you how noisy it is. It's very pixelated as well. But as soon as you get your mouse off of it, it shows you how smooth it is going to be. I highly recommend this product, especially over something like Topaz Denoise. So... I'm going to go to select AI and I'm just going to make sure we're on number two, version two for AI. We're going to denoise at 90% and we're going to in boost our detail by about 15%. I'm going to leave it as is, except I do need to select linear because we have not stretched the image. I find sometimes this is one that's hard to remember, but linear, just think I have not stretched it. My histogram is just going to be a blank line. That's kind of the way that I remember it. So we're going to click hold and drag that on and it is going to take just a minute. We'll fast forward and be right back. Okay, so Star Exterminator has completed. So if we zoom in really close here, we should be able to see before, after, before, after. And I hope you can see it in the video. So we have this beautifully smooth image now, and we can go to multiple areas here. And usually these background spots um, are the ones that are most impacted. If we look here. Yeah, you see we've got like a little bit of purple, a little bit of blue, a little bit of red, and now it's just one smooth background there. All right, so we've run... Noise Exterminator. So now the thing I'm going to do is I'm going to press F12 on the keyboard to kill the auto stretch. And now, yeah, let's just go to Process, All Processes. We're going to go to Histogram Stretch or transform more, Transformation. Histogram Transformation. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click the little circle because I want a real-time preview. And then I'm going to click the Reset button 
So we start fresh, and then because I want to see where our histogram actually is, I'm going to click this track view button. You can see our histogram is way over here. So I'm not going to touch the uh, the white point. I'm just going to touch our mids. And I'm going to drag this all the way over until we start to see a little bit of movement. And then I'm going to click the square to apply it. And then I'm going to reset. I'm going to drag this in until we get right at the peak there, or right at the bottom. And we're going to click reset. And then we're going to bring in the black points to match where our light starts to register in the histogram. And then we'll bring this over to about here. So now, sometimes this happens, and I don't know exactly why, but when you do your color calibration, sometimes your green gets really offset. I'm going to correct that by dragging my mid all the way back out. That way our red, blue, and green are in similar spots. And then I'm gonna click Apply. And then I'm gonna click Reset. And then I'm gonna go back to RGB because we just went to just the green channel. And now look, they're much more aligned. The red does need a little bit of a boost. So let's get that in line right there. And then we're gonna say Apply. And what I'm looking at is right here, these three peaks, I like to have them almost completely in a perfect line. Um, that way they're properly red, blue, and green, and we're not swamping with just green or, you know, another color. But I do like to get the histogram to push out, usually to this line here. Sometimes if you have low noise, but you have really good signal, you can get it to this horizontal line here. But usually it's this halfway uh, line that you see just right there. So we're going to reset. We're going to click the midtone. We're going to drag it up to about right here see where we're at so here's where you can start to kind of mess with a little bit we'll drag this in and at the top what i'm looking at is right here i don't want to come in too far where we start clipping actual data but i do want it to come right up to where we start to see this uh red line it looks purple because of the red and blue overlap right here where it starts to come up which is about right here so I'm going to pull the black point down here to that point right about here. And then I'm going to stop with the black point. I'm going to grab our mid-tone, our mid-range one, and I'm going to pull it. And I'm going to watch our image to the side to see where I want it. Sometimes I find if you start farther inside to do an overstretch and then work your way back out, that works best. Some people like to work with um a little bit cooler of colors which would be probably about here and what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna focus on the star color because we're actually gonna pull all of these stars out and then we're gonna modify our gases and dusts a little bit more once the stars are out so i'm gonna pay attention to our stars and i'm gonna get our stars where i want to see them so this is probably good right about here for our stars so i'm gonna go ahead and say apply and now I didn't look where I was at at any point, but if you look closely, I'm right next to that point where I told you you, you might want to shoot for. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to minimize the histogram transformation. And now I'm going to close out of our preview screen because now I only want to see the actual image. We are done with the background, so I am going to go ahead and say delete the preview. So this is our image right here. This is stretched and ready to go. So some people, what they'll do right now is they'll correct the magenta stars, but I actually want to pull out the stars first because some of that magenta color, we do want aspects of it later in the processing, not with the stars though, but with the background. But I found if I run the script utilities, and correct magenta stars, it actually removes some of my color data from my nebulosity. So I actually prefer to wait to run this particular script until after I've run Russell Crowman's Star Exterminator. So now I find it here, Star Exterminator. I'm gonna say select AI and make sure I have the latest, which is version 10. I do wanna generate a star map image.
gonna go ahead and minimize the star exterminator. And now that I have all of the magenta out of the image that I do not want, you can leave the magenta stars in. NASA sure as heck does. They don't usually correct the magenta stars, but a lot of people find the magenta stars is a bit overwhelming, and some people find it incredibly ugly. I think under the right circumstances, having even a little magenta still in them is appropriate. But with this particular image, we don't have a ton of uh, color variations and such. So I'm going to go ahead and extract most of our magenta, leaving just a little bit behind. To do that, I'm going to go to Script, I'm going to go to Utilities, and then I'm going to go to Correct Magenta Stars. It's going to be right here. I'm not going to touch anything, except I'm only going to do 0.7. So 70% of the magenta I'm going to go ahead and pull out. I'm going to run that. It's going to invert it. It's going to pull out 70% of the green with the inversion. It's going to then put it back to the way it was. And now we just have, and I'll close out of this, we have stars that no longer have magenta. However, you can see just faintly, we do have a little left. This star would have been magenta and a very strong one. So look at this star right here. So what we did effectively is we ran a script that inverted our image. Then it inverted version of magenta is green. Then it pulled out the green by running a program called SCNR, and it pulls out 70% of the green. Then, after that's complete, we look like this. It's kind of a tealish color, and then we re-invert the image, and then we get this. So it looks a little more on the purple side as opposed to full-on magenta, and it is just a trace of it you can see like this bright one had a lot of magenta in it uh, before we ran it very very bright star but now without it almost looks like it's a blue because i'm not doing rgb stars in here this does give it a little bit more of a natural appearance uh, not 100 percent obviously but close enough so i'm gonna go ahead and minimize this and i'm gonna pull it over here so now what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna go back to our histogram transformation because i do want to modify this just a little bit more. So I'm going to go histogram. I'm going to go preview by clicking the circle. I'm going to pull our preview up just so I can see it here. And I'm going to say reset. And now if you look, I can pull in our black point just a little bit more. And then I can play with our colors to brighten it up. Maybe, let's see, so we started about here. I'm gonna add just a little bit more by pulling in that midpoint to the left. I'm gonna boost that color just a little bit more. And I think I like that right about there. And this is 100% uh, touch. It's whatever you really want it to be. I could edit this image a hundred times and I probably am not gonna get the same colors every single time or even twice possibly. So from here, I do like to take this to Photoshop. The one that I'm gonna be targeting using today is actually that second option, the Astro Flat Pro. And what that'll do is you can see we have a lot of kind of fuzziness to this. And I find that tool really works wonderfully. Um, you can get that out inside of PixInsight, but I find sometimes it's quicker and easier and cleaner just to do it this way. So I say, save as this image. I'm gonna to go to SH2115. Here's my PixInsight Photoshop folder. I'm gonna to create today's date, that way I can keep it separate from the first time I had tried this back when I first started imaging this target. Today is the 21st. So now I'm gonna leave it as SH02, and I'm gonna say Save As. I'm gonna convert it to a 16-bit because that works better for Photoshop, and then I'm gonna minimize this because I'm done with this image. We open up Photoshop. Now we're gonna to go to our PixInsight folder in today's date and open that image. Now what I'm gonna do on the keyboard is I'm gonna say Control and J. So that way I create a new layer right here. And I told you about astronomy tools. This set right here is astronomy tools. Starzona makes a pack as well that I have purchased and it works wonderfully with certain items, especially galaxies. Um, with astronomy tools, they have a bunch of tools that you can do the same things in Photoshop that you do in PixInsight. 
Um, I think PixInsight is a little bit more comprehensive with working with astrophotos because it was designed specifically for astronomy photos. Whereas Photoshop is just, we can do some of these same things and in different ways. Um, but for the sake of this, on this layer one, I'm now going to go up to filter. And yes, I do have topaz, but again, I don't like to use them. Um, but I'm going to go to this Astro Flat Pro. Now what it's going to do is it's going to give me this and it's going to give me initial setting recommendations. And you can see it removes a lot of that magenta over here. It gets rid of that fuzziness, the same fuzziness that we see up here. So let's run it and let's see a before and after. You see how it really removes a lot of uh, the ugliness to that image and it really flattens this image out as far as uh, gradients and such and it does a wonderful job in my opinion sometimes it does it too strong so you can change your opacity to be different levels here but you can see how we remove most of it so we're going to leave it i'm going to right click and i'm going to say flatten my image that's all i'm doing literally that's the only thing i'm doing so i'm going to say save as instead of sho2 i'm going to say sho3 this will pop up. I'll leave it exactly as is and say, okay, you want to make sure it's a TIFF file is the key thing. We'll minimize this screen. We double click in the background. We're going to go to our Pix inside folder that I created and grab SHO3. And side by side, you can see these images are drastically different with just such a simple tool to run that flattening. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a duplicate really quick because I want to see what happens when I run HDR multi-scale transform. So again, processes, all processes, this will populate as such. Let's see what it defaults to. It defaults to six. Sometimes six is a bit much. Um, so let's just try seven layers. We're gonna put a click into lightness and uh, lightness mask. And I'm gonna click, hold and drag onto here. And I'm just gonna see what this does. I don't do this on every image, but because it's so bright inside of this tunnel, I wanna see if we can run HDR and pull out a little bit more detail from it. You see what we did there? We, we took down that brightness level and it actually gave us some new looks at that gas and dust in here, specifically in this region right here. And we haven't really even modified the image, so to speak. We're just bringing down that brightness in that area. Let's see what it did to the overall image. I'm betting it brought down a lot. It did. So we can clean this up. I obviously don't want to bring any of this over on the left-hand side down. So what we can do, let's minimize this photo here and minimize this. Okay, so SHO3, we're going to call this one SHO, let's just say SHO3 underscore one. So it's still the third one, but a different version. So now what I'm going to do is go to process, all processes, and I'm going to go to range selection. You want to open up a preview, and now I only want to apply this to the white areas. So what we're going to do is we're going to guesstimate that it's about here. Let's boost our fuzziness so it's nice and there we go. Fuzziness. Let's pull it back up just a little and say enter. And then we're going to minimize our range mask selection. We're going to kill our preview. So here's our range mask. So I don't want it to apply to anything over here. So I'm going to go back to process, all processes, and we are going to find clone stamp. So this tool is a little finicky in the sense of you have to make sure you click these things in this order. So you have to reset. Let's go with a radius of 50. And you can't just click. But what it does tell us is down here, please select a valid source point. To do so, you have to say control click. So what we're going to do is we're defining effectively what we want to clone. And I want to clone the black. So I'm going to click the black. And then I'm going to start painting over all of this. That radius is definitely not enough. So let's say maybe 150. Here we go. 
we go. And I'm going to get rid of all of this white because I simply don't want it. And you know what? Because let's say 400. Oh, 400 is too big. Let's say 200. Yeah, there we go. Because I don't want it to apply to anything here. So let's reset our point. Control, click. And then let's go right beside it here. And then I'm going to go perfectly up and down. Because if you start clicking here, you're going to paint anything that's white over it. So in this case, I only want to apply the HDR to the white space. So we'll remove all the areas we don't want impacted. Perfect. Now this is where it's finicky. If I close clone stamp, it will not save everything. You have to execute that first. It's almost like you're looking at a view only. So I'm gonna click execute. Now it is applied. I'm done with a clone stamp. What I'm going to do, and I actually don't even need this image now that I think about it. So we're going to actually close this image. Yes. Because I still want to operate off of this image. And here's why. Because I applied the HDR to the other image so the whole image was impacted. But I created a range mask because I only want it applied to a specific section. So I need to go back to the original image before I applied that HDR. And now what we're going to do is we're going to click over here on the side and drag this mask just below the name. If I put it over here, it won't work. You have to put it right here in this light gray bar. And now we have a mask. So anything in red will be protected. Anything that's not in red is going to be updated. So what I'm going to do, because I can see this is the area that I wanted that to apply, is I'm actually going to not show the mask so I can still see the whole image. I'm going to zoom in, I'm going to come over here, I'm going to reopen HDR multi-scale transform, and just to see what it does, let's put it at 6 and then drag it, and now it's only going to apply to this area right here. Wow, look at that. I feel like Owen Wilson. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, that's incredible to me. I like that. So let's stick with that 6. I really like that. It, it really highlights some of this detail that I don't think we get even with seven iterations or layers, I mean. Yeah, I kind of like that dark structure a little bit more. So let's go with six. Yeah, that looks that looks awesome. I like that a lot. And now to confirm that we didn't update anything else, I'm going to do undo, redo, undo, redo. You see we protected everything with that range mask and then do clone stamp. You can take this into Photoshop and you can paint in over your layers. Um, if you take two images and combine them as separate layers and mask it that way and paint it in. Um, I won't demonstrate that for now because this way works really, really well for us. So this is our image. I'm done with my mask, so I'm going to right-click in the image and say remove the mask, and I'm going to move the mask over. I am going to keep it just because I think it's best to keep it in case you need it for future purposes for any reason. But at this point, I'm really happy with where we're at here. You could almost just call this a final image, but I want to remove some of that green, and I also want to boost some of our blues. So to do that, we're going to go into what I call the coloring phase. How we do that is we only want to stretch those particular colors. So we're going to go to script, utilities, and color mask. And here's where we're going to say, I want to create a green color mask. And then down here, I'm going to do uh, three or four works out well. It just, it blurs the mask so you get more of a smooth transition, so to speak. We're going to say, okay. So we get the mask. And it's blurred a little bit. I'm going to minimize it. And the way to look at this is, is, is the SHO3 green mask. Color mask green. Um, sometimes you people want to rename that to say green. I'll leave it there because I know the G corresponds to green. And then I'm going to rerun color mask. And I'm going to pick cyan because this is more cyan than blue. And same thing. One, two, three. And OK. Now we get a lot of the same areas. And I'm going to put this up here. 
And then one color that a lot of people seem to miss is yellow. We've got a lot of yellow in this image. And I'm going to do four just so it blurs it a little bit more because I don't want to overpower my image with any yellow. Um, so we're going to get a nice blur to that one. But you can see there's a lot of yellow into this image, specifically right around SH2112. So we have these three color masks. So how do we start working? I'm going to grab the green one. I find it's best to just go ahead and start with your base color, which is green, which is our hydrogen. Minimize your color mask once it's applied. We can confirm the mask is on by saying show mask. But because I don't like to work with it like that, I like to disable the show mask, but the mask is still on. And we know it's still on because over here, our tab is going to be this brown color. So we know we have a mask on. If I just quickly demonstrate remove mask, see how it's gray again? So we're going to open up the mask. We're going to click, hold, and drag it, and drop it. It's the brown color. I know it's on. Now I'm going to go to, once I can find it here, Curves Transformation. And I'm going to go to Preview. Make this window a little smaller so I can see the whole thing. And likewise, I don't need this to be monstrously big. Okay, so here's our image. Let's see if we can drag this out just a little. There we go. Okay, so we're only going to be touching the green color. So when you're doing green, typically you want to boost your red and pull your green down just a little bit because green is not natural in space from everything that I can tell. Um, it uh, In some circumstances it looks okay, but for the most part green is not natural. But a combination of colors can make green, which is totally fine to leave in your image. And let me show you with when we boost this red, and some people really like orange a lot. I don't like orange that much. If you drag it to where you don't like it, you can, while you're still holding it or not, either way, if I click like this a million times, I can get in that general area of that block and I can right click it and it will remove it. The other option is if you're just working with that one line and you just don't like that one line or maybe you're you've done so many and you just don't want to click all of them off just click reset and it'll take it back to where you were so i find let's boost that red just a little bit i don't like to go overkill i like to do this in iteration so i'll do multiple variations of this so we'll boost that red we're going to bring down the green but what i find and i like to move this a lot just so you can see what happens so i like the idea of actually I'm going to click the X just, that's the other one. If I boost the green and I don't like what I did for just the green, but I've already hit this, again, I can right click it, or right here is this red X. This red X will apply to just that green line that you're currently modifying. So you can pull down your green a little bit, but you can also boost your green on the higher end, on your, um, towards the white point there. And you can actually cause it to have a little bit more of a highlight in those green areas to make a yellow. So we can save that. Now if I put a bunch of blue in, it should go way too much blue and almost to a purple where you get a lot of the, the green and blue mixing. Um, there you go. So you can create some crazy looking images, but we're not gonna do that for the sake of this. I do need to see what happens. We're going to leave the blue as is. I'm going to pull that red back up a little bit. Yeah, I'm going to slip it the highlights. Yeah, let's boost that red and the highlights a little bit. This will help create a little contrast too. Um, let's see if I can demonstrate this. If we look over to the left-hand side, the where I'm going to be watching most is right here. So if I boost the red, and then I highlight the red. You see, it's pretty faint, but you can just see right where it's really highlighted there. We're going to add just a little bit of extra to it, and that way we get a little boost from that area. Let's say okay. 
We can then look at pulling our green down. Yeah, just a little bit. I like that. But let's now go to this lightness. I want to boost our lightness and make this whole area maybe just a little. I don't like that. Let's see if we can just do maybe our RGB. Pull up the red, blue, and green just a little. We can pull it down here and really create a softer image, but I like a little more vibrancy to it. So let's boost that there, but because we boosted the lightness, we also need to boost our saturation a little bit. Obviously, way too much. But usually if you boost your lightness, I boost the saturation an equal amount. Okay, so that's just the green. So this image is starting to work itself out. Let's do some cyan coloring. And now we're not... Again, we're not adding anything that doesn't exist. We're just manipulating the data that is there. Because we are doing a Hubble palette, these colors aren't natural to begin with. So we are doing is we're changing the coloration just a little bit to really enhance and boost contrast. So we are on the cyan. I don't want to boost the red as much. I do want to come over here to this, the CIE B component. And watch this, if I drag this down, we can change the color of our blue to be ultra turquoise, which that's obviously gonna be a bit much. But we can pull it down just a little bit to give it a little more boost of a turquoise-ish color, and we can apply that. Then what we can do is we can actually boost our green in that area. You see how that actually gives us a little more contrast to our hydrogen? I don't want to do it much, but maybe just a tiny little bit. And then let's see what happens when we put our blue in. We're going to start it up high and work our way in. We need to boost it. Let's maybe go an equal. Eh, let's go about halfway. Halfway between our start point and the green. And then we'll click apply. So I'm happy with that blue. It looks decent. Then we'll come over here to our yellow mask. And we're going to just apply that. If you forget what mask you applied, just grab the mask that you do want and put it over it. And the other mask will automatically fall off. So we are in our yellow. So we do know a boost in red will add a lot of highlight to it there. You see that? So let's boost our red. We're going to pull out some of that green and see what it should make it too dark. Let's maybe just pull it down a little bit down here on the low end. And let's see what happens when we boost it here. You see how over on the right hand side in particular, we really boost the yellow when we drag the highlight up. So I'm going to leave it about right here. That should think is a nice little highlight inside that area and saturation let's see if we get much we get a lot of value in saturating it maybe but what i don't like is how it's not saturating more of that so i'm going to go back to the green mask because i want a lot of that red to really stand out here so just the red let's boost it Let's see what happens when I give it a little saturation. So that's really nice right there. It's not overly saturated. Like, obviously, this would be quite a bit overkill. But we can tell we don't have any crazy color gradients or truly defined overlapping areas where you can see, like, oh, wow, this... This color started and stopped right here. You're looking for something that's going to be a little bit smoother overall. And then we're going to do something here in a minute that's actually going to smooth it out even more. So I'm going to call that good with our coloring right there. I'm fairly happy with that. And now what I'm going to do is say remove mask. So the next thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to blur this image. But before I do, I've got to put my stars back in. So how do we put our stars back in? We need to go to pixel math. 
So right over here is pixel math, or again, process, all processes. We're going to go to our P's and find pixel math down here at the bottom. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say SHO3 plus SHO2 underscore stars. And the way I know that is over here is that file. The other option is if you don't want to type it is to go to this expression editor. Now keep in mind we're not updating just green or just blue or just red in this case. We're going to update all of it. So I'm going to leave this use single RGBK expression selected because I only want to update one. I don't want to update each one individually. This would be more appropriate if you're creating a HOO image where you're going to combine formulas to make an overall image. But in this case, we're combining existing images to re to put those stars back in. So I'm going to go to expression editor. And the other option you have is if we know our file names is we can say SHO3, which is the title here, plus SHO2 stars, and just say OK. Then I'm going to click hold and drag. So before and after, we've got all of our stars back. And there we go. So now that we have our stars back in, what we can do is convolute this image. I'm going to blur it. We're going to make it so blurry that you lose all of your details. Look at that. That does, it looks crazy now, right? Before and after. Before and after. Now you may be wondering why we're doing that here. But the first thing we got to do is leave this image up here. We're done with our stars, so let's pull that over here. We're done with our coloring, so let's put that down here. We're going to go to our luminance, and we're going to start all over. This is our detail layer. We only wanted this image because it gave us colors. So we're going to go to minimize. We're going to think we already did our dynamic crop earlier on, but now we need to redo this process, right? We're going way back. So delete our insides. Okay. Division, normalize, discard, and replace. Execute. Close that. Let's pull up our screen transfer function and restretch. Now we're going to go to automatic background extractor. We're going to leave subtraction, but we're going to disable normalize. We're going to click hold and drag. It's going to go black. So we're going to minimize that. We're going to click our radiation button and boom, we got our image, which is exactly like what we started with before um, regarding the colored image. So we're going to minimize that. We don't have to do um, background neutralization or color calibration. We will go ahead and run noise exterminator. Once that's done, we'll be right back. Okay, so now we've run our noise app. We can see before and after, before and after. Pretty substantial jump before and after. Quite noticeably different. So now that we've run the noise, the next thing we're going to do is stretch our image. So we're going to press F12 to kill that. We're going to go to histogram transformation. We're going to open up the preview. I'm going to minimize this screen for my purposes. We are going to make sure the check mark is selected and we're going to reset. And we're going to drag in our midpoint to the base of that line. We're going to say square to execute. We're going to reset and do it again. Square to execute, reset. Now that we're a little bit of a bigger peak and trough area here, we can pull in our black point. And again, we're looking at the top graph to make sure we don't clip, which would look like that. We want to bring it in just to the point where it almost touches. Then we're going to bring this to the base here, where this base kind of rounds out. We're going to check out the image, then I'm going to pull it to the next base right up here, which I think is where I'm going to want it. Okay, I'm going to say Execute and Reset. So I'm actually really happy with this, especially with the stars, and we can confirm. Look at that. 
this is almost identical to where our RGB image was, which is excellent. You want these to be really close. So do pay attention to where this peak actually hits because you will want these to be similar between your color image and this. Once you've done this enough from feel alone, you should be able to almost match these up, which you just saw I did without really even paying attention to the top one. I was going off of how does this image feel? What does it look like? Um, you can modify it a little bit more even, but if you pull in your black, you're likely going to pull up your white, which is going to land you again in the same spot. I'm very happy with where the stars are. They're not overly bloated. They look really nice and tight. Um, so I'm good with that. I applied it. I can click the reset, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to minimize histogram. We're going to close the preview. And this is our image. Right, we look at our stars and they look really, really nice. And that's all I care about right now. I don't care about the other details of the image, just the stars. Because that's what we're going to be modifying effectively. Because, like before, we're going to run star exterminator now. By generating a star mask, it is no longer linear. We're going to apply that. All right, so we now are done. So let's minimize this tool. We've got our star mask, so I'm going to minimize that and I'm going to leave it up here. You can kind of see some of those, uh, the weird fuzziness that we had in that color image. So we're going to do the same thing. But first, we're going to boost this just a little bit more now that that's gone. So histogram transformation. We're going to click the preview button. We're going to reset the image. So now I'm going to pull in just a little bit here. And then we're going to boost the mids just a little bit. And I'm going to focus primarily on this side of it because, remember, we're going to run the HDR over here, which is the high dynamic range, which will actually kill that brightness. So we're really wanting to get this to the point that we're pretty happy with it. How about right about there? Okay, so we'll close all that. We'll minimize this. So now we're going to use the same range mask in this case, right? We can use the same one because we cropped the same size and it's the same area of interest. So we're going to drop that range mask over here. We're going to minimize it. And you can confirm that only the stuff that's showing is going to be impacted. Anything that's red will not. Now, if you want to update everything but that, you would just simply invert the mask. Again, everything in red is protected. White is not. But for this sake, we're going to go back to mask. We're going to uninvert it and we can see that I don't need to see it anymore so I'm going to just turn it off it's still applied because it's on the has the brown tab but we don't have it applied to the actual image that way we can watch it and see it so I'm going to open up the HDR and I'm going to zoom in and scroll over that way we can watch this area I did six before we applied to lightness and we created a lightness mask so we're going to do the same thing here And that's all we're doing. We're going to do the exact same thing we did before. But before and after, you will see really, really overly bright versus some nice highlights. And we have some nice detail here in these dust lanes that we'll be able to really highlight here momentarily. So what we'll do, we'll go to mask, remove the mask, and then same thing as before. I'm going to say save as. So this is SL1. It is a TIFF file. I'm going to save it as a 16-bit unsigned integer. I'm going to say OK. I'm going to go back to Photoshop. I'm going to open it. Control J to create a copy of that mask. I'm going to go to filter. Now you'll notice Topaz Denoise doesn't work. If you use it and you can't figure out why you don't have it, it only works with RGB images. You have to go to image mode and turn on RGB color and then that will become, I'm going to say don't flatten, and then Topaz will become available if you use it. I, I don't recommend it, though. I don't think it's worth it. It's not worth the money, that's for sure. I'm going to go to Astro Flat Pro. Let it run and look at that. I think I'm going to be pretty content with that. Let's see our before and after. Before, after, before, after. Yeah, that looks really good. Because you can see how hazy it is here but then how almost pitch black it is right here. Once I turn it on, I lose the haze. I get my, my dust and gas, and then these black spots are still black, but they're a little bit smoother with a color change. If you just watch right here, see that? Like it, it just, it looks a little cleaner. 
So now over here, I'm going to right click and say flat my image. And again, that's all I'm going to do. So file, save as SL2. Okay. Go back to pics. We're done with this image. That was SL1, so we're going to pick up SL2 for superluminance 2. And that looks really, really nice right there. So now I am going to just check, not HDR. I'm going to pull up my histogram transformation again. Preview. And here. And I'm going to see if I can do just a little bit more here. We can actually pull in that black point a little bit more. We can boost these highlights. Let's make sure we don't overdo it. Yeah. You gotta be careful. We're just gonna bring it to this line right here and say, okay. So two problems if you overstretch this again, you could lose a lot of the saturation in your color when you apply later. That's always a risk if you make it too bright. Okay, so now that we've done that histogram boost, we really like where this is at. Let's go ahead and put this together. The next thing we got to do is get a pixel math again. Remove your current formula. Let's go to expression editor. We're going to pick up SLL SL2 plus SL1 stars. Okay. Pull those stars back in. We have our stars. It looked nice. So now we're not going to blur this image, but we are going to minimize it. And let's put it right under SH03. We're going to go to channel, uh, not channel combination, but LRGB combination. So here, I'm going to actually open up SH03. This is our blurred image on the left-hand side. What we're going to do is we're going to say, I want to apply the superluminance only. And I'm going to remove this chrominance noise mask. The problem with this is it takes a little while to run. And all I want to do for now is see what happens when I drag that luminance over our color image. And look at that. It, that looks excellent. I'm so happy with this. You can back it out. And you can actually, and this gets really confusing. I don't know why this is the way it is. But if you decrease the lightness here and the saturation here, it will actually increase it in the image. It's backwards. I don't fully understand why you would think if you boost your saturation percentage, it would boost it in the image too, but this actually decreases it in the image. Um, so we're going to decrease here. Let's bump this down to 46 and our lightness. Let's bump it to maybe 48. I'm going to put on the chrominance because I have a feeling this is going to turn out really nice. So while it's running, it's again, it's come, it's overlaying your detailed image on your blurred color because we don't care about the blurred color anymore. We just want the color from it on top of our detail layer. And then um, that's all we're really going to do here. And then it will run just an extra iteration of noise reduction for us, which is totally fine. So look at that. This is our image. This is what we have in our details. We've not added anything to it and we've not taken anything from it. We've simply boosted what we can and looked at what we've got. So if you come in here, you can see we have these nice pillars. If you look at your image when it was blurred or before it was blurred, like you can see there's detail, but there's not a great deal of detail but when we add it, look at that. The difference of using a luminance mask allows us to boost those details a little bit more. Your stars do lose some of the coloring um, in the process. They're almost white stars, which is why a lot of people will shoot uh, an SHO image with RGB stars. But in this case, I'm not going to. But what I am going to do is when you look at this image, you were just overwhelmed with stars. So I'm going to go to script. And there's the Easy Processing Suite Star Reduction. And I use this, it works excellent. So what we're gonna first do is create a star mask for reduction. This does take a little bit of time. Okay, so now we have our star mask. All I'm gonna do is say, run Easy Star Reduction. 
Okay, so to see what we actually got, I'm going to go ahead and delete this because we can always create another one if needed. But if we look at our stars, I'm going to do undo, before, and after, before, and after. Let's move up to these big stars up here, before and after. So you can see it does reduce their overall brightness, allowing us to look more at the surrounding nebulosity versus just a million stars everywhere and we're a little overwhelmed with all these stars so we can actually decrease it and you'll see it mostly like down in this area here in the background when we run it so it before and after so I like this because it kind of we're not removing any details we're just dimming that light so it enhances our nebulosity a bit so I'm really happy with where this image is but we can even go a step further so up here is the extract CIEL component, which is basically, let's create a luminance mask. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to apply this mask right here directly to my colored image, and I'm gonna minimize the mask and pull it over to the side. Then I'm gonna do local histogram equalization. Now, when you do galaxies, this kernel radius, the smaller it is, the more likely it is to enhance your dust lanes. But for a nebula, we actually want this number to be a little bit higher. So I'm gonna say 275. And you can decrease these to 10 bit and 12 bit, but I'm just gonna leave it exactly as is. And I'm gonna go ahead and drag it on. This does take a little bit of time to run. So I'm gonna fast forward at this point. If we go back, you can see the coloration that it does here. Uh, maybe we need a little more. Okay, so before, after, before and after. Sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. In this case, I don't feel like it's going to work well because it's given us a, a histogram equalization, but it's also making it so much brighter in areas that you lose your color feel. Let's go over here and look at this area. See how it, it brightens your image up so much that I'm not really a fan of that. So let's try it again with maybe even less. Let's say 325 and let's change the 12 bit down to 10 bit and run this again and see what we get. Okay, so let's look at before and after. And it's kind of doing the same thing. It's really making it pop in areas, but it's so much that I'm not liking it that much. So let's go back. I do like that better, but let's change the amount to maybe only 30%. And let's rerun it. Okay, so before and after. Before and after. That's much more subtle, and I like that way better. Yeah. But now what I'm going to do is, because we do have our mask on, I'm going to go to Curve Transformation. And I'm going to boost our saturation, but let's see by how much. Obviously, that's way too much. And I like to move it kind of quick because it's, it's really off of feel, but I know it's going to be less than here. Kind of watch. You kind of watch for the green color. The green really pops when you saturate it. The other colors kind of stay marginally okay but you can see that green as soon as i stretch it green pops the quickest in my experience so you really want to find where do you start to see green i see green there so we're going to go about halfway and that looks fine right there so i'm going to go ahead and say apply but let's see if there's any other corrections we want to make do we want to lighten it up at the same time maybe we want to pull it down a little bit but hit our highlights no. Do we want to change our blues at all? No, that kind of updates all of them. But we can boost our RGB just a little bit here. Let's say bring it down slightly there. And up here. That looks fine. So we'll say go. So what I've been able to do is actually keep a little bit of the green in i do like having some green not always in not um let me remove remove mask 
It's very subtle, but it's more of like a turquoise meets green. So it is kind of right in the middle. And I do like having that green right in here um, left behind, but we still have that nice turquoise color. Now, I've tried to stick to that. Um, you do get some of the blue, but as long as you have some turquoise in there, you're kind of on that more natural looking edge um, with that. So I'm really, really happy with this. And I think we're going to call this good with Pix Insight. So I'm going to say file, save as, and I'm going to call this SHO4. We're going to say OK. We're going to go to Photoshop now because there's a little technique here that I like to apply sometimes. So we have this particular image. What I'm going to do is say Control J to make a new layer. I'm going to go to Filter, Other, and high pass and basically what we're going to do and it, it's kind of hard to see it but you're going to boost your radius and let me see if i can't really overly show this you're going to boost your radius so you put an emphasis on dark structure so we're going to take this a little bit higher than five you can kind of see right here uh, there you go you can kind of see that coming into play you don't want too little because it's pretty faint and you don't want a lot. So we're going to do maybe about six. Let's just call it six even. I like six. There we go. So now what we're going to do is we're going to come up here and we're going to change what our layer type is. And I'm going to go between soft light and overlay. Let's just go with soft light. So now if I press the alt key, I need to get, let's go with the paintbrush. Press and hold the Alt key, I can zoom in. So here's before and after, before and after. You can see it kind of puts an emphasis on that dark structure. It kind of pops a little bit more. And I think I like this enough that I'm gonna use it. Now, I know in other times I've used this, when there's just a little bit of dark structure, I would prefer to just paint it in because I don't want the whole image to get all this because if you look really closely, watch the stars. The stars actually re-pop. We're making them big again. So a lot of times I like to do this. I like to come into my dark structure. While selected on the layer mask, I will then, or on the layer, then I'll create a layer mask. Then I'm going to go control I to invert it. I'm going to come over and make sure I have a white paintbrush. And I'm going to pick 100% opacity and flow. And see, I can just paint it in on these areas that I want to really pop. I don't want everything to pop, but just the dark areas. I don't want all these stars to come back for me. So I'm just going to come in. I'm just going to hit all these little dark structures to make them pop a little bit more. I'm not adding data to it. I'm just kind of bringing out the details a little bit more than I already have. So down here, and I don't do this in any specific facets. I'm pretty content with um, just doing it at a high level and non-specific. Let's see, where else do we want to go? We definitely want this, yeah. And you can see it just, it puts an emphasis on the dark spots, and that's all. And here looked better, so I'll just hit that area, hit this area. That looked good. Let me hit some of these dark structures in here. I think we already did that. I'm not going to do all that dark structure, but we'll come over here. We'll kind of hit just these general areas that you see the light dark. Like right here, if I click it, it should enhance just a little bit. That's a little neat area. We'll come up here. We'll hit these pillars. Kind of darken those up and this is just adding a little extra contrast and definition and depth to your overall image well we'll hit here here um yeah we'll hit that come over there and again you could have just done this on the whole image there's a lot to it for this particular image and it doesn't always work where you will want to use this um just so happens in this image i kind of like that feel so we add a little bit of texture to these areas is all we've done. And when you look at it, 
from a high level, you almost can't even notice you did anything at all. But we know we did. I'm not there. So from here, I think we're good. So this is really all I do at this point. I save the image and I call it a day and that's all I do. Um, and from here I can post it and I share it and I will do so in the video. So thank you very much for joining us. If you have any questions or concerns or any need any assistance, please add it in the comments below. And if you liked what you saw today, I plan on doing more of these. Make sure to subscribe, hit the thumbs up, click the little bell to make sure you get notified of all my future videos as well. You know, every time I do this, I get different results. I could go back and reprocess this again, and I could get a completely different result at the end, but I'm pretty content with this. This really highlights a lot of the detail. It keeps some of that green that I like to see, and it gives me really a lot of joy seeing what is out in space, and that's why I do this, is because every single time I look at these images, you see something new, and you see something different. So um, thank you very much for your time, and again, questions, comments, let me know down below and otherwise clear skies and thanks for joining